Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS Windows 95 days. And today, I'm going to attempt to write a complete Windows application that lives entirely within a simple QR code. Now, I don't simply mean the location of the application is linked there for your phone to go look up. I mean, can we actually code and fit an entire running Windows application within the black and white bleeps and bloops of the QR code itself? If we succeed, I'll then show you how to load and run it just by holding it up to the web camera. That's right, it's like code written by Schrodinger's cat. Code so small you can run it just by looking at it. Now if you're anything like me, then you haven't handled a physical restaurant menu in quite some time. Even if you're still dining exclusively outside still, recent events have largely mandated a shift to digital menus that we access with our phones. To get that access, you are normally required to scan a fancy square barcode, properly known as a QR code, with your phone, and then the camera app magically decodes a URL from the picture just by looking at it and then launches the web browser to view that URL, which will contain the menu. It's all rather clever, that much is for sure, but for those of you who are not aware, the code you're scanning is of course not the menu itself, but rather just a link to the menu up on the web. Your phone has to use that link to go on the internet to retrieve the actual menu, as the code itself contains only the text of the URL. So we could, in theory, write an application and place it on the internet somewhere and then put a link to that application in a QR code. The browser wisely inserts multiple prompts in the download path if you try and it thereby introduces an extra step or two. And that really isn't putting a program inside a QR code, it's just putting a URL to a program inside a QR code, which is merely linking to a program. And I'm here to decree that linking to a program just isn't that interesting. It's akin to putting the name of a ship on a piece of paper and stuffing it in a bottle instead of actually building a ship in the bottle. When it comes to the QR code, we want an actual ship inside the bottle here too, as it were. We want the whole program within the QR code itself, not just the name of it or a link to it. I also want the computer to be able to load and execute the QR code without having to go off and hit the web in any way. It should work totally disconnected too. I want all the code and graphics and resources and image header and loader and everything else needed within the QR code itself. But is that even possible from a technical perspective? And if it is, is there really enough room in a QR code for an entire Windows application, even a simple one? I'm pretty sure the answer to the first question is yes. I know you can store raw text in a QR code and a few experiments I undertook before this seem to indicate that you can store, but not always retrieve, binary data as well. More about this limitation later. but. Worst case, if we have to store the program as text, we can use a process known as UU encoding, which is a cross-platform and standard way to represent binary where normally only text is supported. It came about as part of the original Unix to Unix copy program for sending binary data over text lines, and it also enables scenarios like sending digital pictures in email. If you have to put a binary somewhere that normally only accepts text, UU encoding is your friend. If there's enough space in the QR code, I'll show you how to do it both ways because UU encoding does have a little overhead and therefore it takes a bit more space. And that whole question of how much space is in the QR code is going to be key. If you can store a URL or other string, then clearly the QR code can hold some amount of data for us, but how much data? According to Wikipedia, QR codes can't just be arbitrarily large. There are certain acceptable predefined international formats and the largest of these appears to be known as 40L. That symbol is 177 pixels square and has a maximum capacity of 2,953 bytes. For those of you in the audience with ADD who would now silently go down the tangent of squaring 177 to find out how many bits there are and then dividing by 8, I'm in that club too and I already did the math for you. 177 pixels square is 3,916 bytes of raw pixels before alignment boxes and error recovery information and so on. So it's about 75% efficient in terms of space, but it can, as I hinted, recover from some damage and errors. Print it out. That symbol will be about the size of a standard old 3.5 inch floppy disk. Even a standard old floppy disk, however, would hold about a thousand times more information than the largest of QR codes is able to. So a thousandth of an old floppy is not a lot of room if you think about it that way. Another way to look at it is that it's so tiny that you can fit 20 of them in memory on a Commodore 64 at the same time. Can I really make a Windows 10 app so small that you could put 20 of them in memory on a Commodore 64? Well, remember that old floppy disk I was talking about? Well, they were initially divided up into something like 40 tracks of 18 sectors each. Each sector of a track held 512 bytes. When an IBM PC compatible computer boots, it reads the first sector of the boot disk, known as the boot sector, into memory. It then treats it as x86 code and executes it. In normal operation, that sector just contains enough information to continue loading the rest of the operating system. 
and for that reason, the boot sector was a common target for viruses as well, as it gets loaded before anything else, making it easy for a virus to shim itself and then hide from detection. In addition to bootloaders and viruses, people also used to write what are known as boot sector games. These games are so tiny that they fit into a single boot sector of 512 bytes. They load way up early, before the game even begins loading, and so are playable within a second or two of the first floppy seek after boot. If you got a game like Snake or Space Invaders running in there, you were doing pretty well because that's just not a lot of memory. So the games are by necessity very simple, but still often impressive given the limitations. The king of these tiny games seems to be a fellow by the name of Oscar T. Gutierrez. He's even written a pair of books on the subject, and I'll link to them in the description. I don't know him and I've never met him, but they look pretty cool from the standpoint of learning to write compact assembly code. Fortunately, we don't have to be quite that small, but we have the additional challenge of import tables and string constants and image headers and other overhead that adds to our code size. We also have certain things we simply must do, like register a window class and pump messages and call begin paint and end paint and so on. All that adds up. In fact, a standard Win32 windowed app that you create with the Visual Studio Wizard winds up being around 100k. If you give up a few runtime conveniences and use limited libraries, you can actually get that C version down to about as little as 3K for an app that simply puts up a message box with no resources. But even then, you're already at the limit and you haven't even created a real window yet, let alone run your message pump or painted anything in that window. So we need to be smaller than that. And for that, I turn to assembly language. In the episode entitled Hello Assembly, I showed you how to write a minimal Windows app in x86 assembly language. If you haven't seen it, check it out next, so I think you'll find it both entertaining and informative. It's also a handy bit of context for this episode, as from here on out, I'm going to be working with the code that we developed in that episode. It implements the minimum functionality that I expect in a real Windows app. Register a window class, create a window, pump messages, custom paint your client area with some content, permit resizing, and handle all of the system menus and widgets appropriately. It does all of these things and winds up at about as little as 1450 bytes plus strings. To stay small, however, we have to survive the linker step. The linker likes to create a section for code, a section for data, and a section for BSS. The problem is that they're then aligned on 512 byte boundaries by default and have their own minimum size, so the linker can grow your code substantially. To that end, then, I'm going to assemble it as normal, but I'm going to show you some handy linker tricks, like how to merge sections and how to pack the ones you do keep tightly together for a minimum size. Well, I can't really put it off much further. It's time to launch a console and get our hands dirty, so let's get to it. Alright, so our first step is going to be to assemble the code, and then we're going to link the code into a binary, which is an XE. Then we're going to for, take two separate paths. In one path, we're going to UU encode the resultant binary and then put that inside of a QR code. And in the other one, we're going to put the binary directly into the QR code. We're going to try it both ways because there's actually a bug in the uh, QR code reading for the camera that doesn't work well with binary images. So if you're trying to read it on a PC, you'd have a problem because it's actually an end of line conversion problem. They convert like zero A's that occur in the binary bitstream into zero A, zero D if it's on Windows. It's a bug, so. It's fixed now, but not till like 23.92. So if you're using Zcam or Zbar image, it will have that bug going up uh, through 23.91, which is the one that's currently on there, so I had to build my own to get it to work. Let's start by assembling and linking our binary. All right, our binary source is 6K. We're going to use MASM, and the actual compiler is called ML. We're going to pass the slash C command, or option, which indicates we don't want it to do the final link yet. We're going to do that on our own. Slash cough means we want a cough header on the binary, and we just need to give it the name of the assembly file. Good. No warnings, no errors. Now we could get even faster and use crinkler instead of linker. And crinkler will actually compress things and link and make it really tiny. But we're already tiny enough, to be honest. So it would just be for bragging rights at this point. And I'll save that if I ever need it to like compete with some kid who like, does it on a better job of this than I do. So uh, I'll, I'll save my bag of tricks for when they are required. For now, we can just link it with the regular old Masm linker. What we're going to do, however, is get a little fancy, and thanks to Sonic Mouse for this little tip, we're going to merge some sections. First, I'm going to merge the RData section to be the same as the text section. And then I'm going to merge the data section to be the same as the text section. 
I don't know if order matters here, but this works in this order, so I'm going with that. Next, we're going to set the section alignment to be 16 bytes. Normally, the only time you even mess with section alignment is for VXDs and drivers, perhaps. So we're going to get a warning that says, hey, you're not building a VXD or a driver, and you're changing the alignment. What's going on? What's going on? They're trying to make it really small. 16 is as small as we can go because the window structure has to be 16 byte aligned. All right, we've got a couple warnings. One is that the alignment is not a driver or a VXD, as I anticipated. The other is that text sections have been merged and have different attributes, and that's okay for us too. For my next step, I'm actually going to drop into the Windows subsystem for Linux because it has tools that I can easily install, like UU encode and QR encode and things like that, that I can do with a package manager that would be harder to install on Windows if they exist. But that's the beauty of WSL. You get all of the good parts of Linux and all the good parts of Windows together at once. It's like that fancy peanut butter they sell here with like, is it not Jif? I don't know, it's got the peanut butter and the jelly mixed in, so you save a step, man. WSL will drop us into the WSL subsystem, and we can then cut run UU encode. And we're gonna say hello assembly.exe, which is our resultant binary. I should have checked the size on that first. I'll check it right away. And the final output file will also be hello assembly.exe. The UU encode command line is kind of weird in that it lets you specify what the program or file name is coming in and going out. Let's say you're going from a system that has long file names to a system that has short file names. You might want to provide your own mapping, and this is where you would do that, but I don't need that. All right, the .exe and the .uu are the two that we're going to make QR codes out of, so let's do that next. mistake. So the first thing I'm going to do is to use the ZBar image program, which is like the ZBar cam program, which will read it from the webcam, but the image program will just read it from an image file. So then I know before I do this whole printout and test it cycle, whether it's going to accept this image in the end, it's kind of a cheat. That's not a cheat, it's testing. Is testing cheating? Some developers might think so. Uh, let's see. So I want ZBar image and I want to say I want it in raw format. So I've decoded the UU PNG into the file called temp.uu. Now if I'm lucky, it's going to contain our UU encoded binary. Oh yeah. It's weird when you go back and forth. I should alias this stuff. You bet. Hello assembly at Exe. That's our friend. And we'll do the same with the XE. Now, what you really want to do when you do this with your version, which you get is 23.92 or later, is run with the .s binary command. Now watch this. Doesn't work for me because I don't have that version. So I do it without, but now, watch what happens when I run temp.exe. What? It's an invalid binary due to incompatibility. And here's what's going on. ZBar image, when it goes to write a 0A, says, hey man, that's an end of line. Convert that quickly to 0A, 0D. And so it injects carriage returns in DR binary. Not handy at all. So, and thanks to uh, Math KC for finding that one. Now, his check-in, as I said, hasn't propagated yet fully, so I don't have it in the downloaded binary, but I do have it in the self-built binary. So let's run it with that one. Before we run the actual other binary, though, let's make sure the UU decoded binary does actually exist and work. So all we need to do is UU decode dash O for output. We'll call it final output.exe, and we'll take temp.uu as the input. It's the real deal. 
Okay, we validated that we're able to store our program in a QR code and then later retrieve it from that image, but only digitally from a file. To validate that this actually works off paper, what I want to have happen is for it to launch the program it finds in the QR code as soon as it sees it. To that end, you have to run this on either a Linux system and then somehow save the file over to your PC because it doesn't exist for Mac OS and the Windows version that's currently checked in and publicly available has a bug that I mentioned earlier. But with a little patch in the binary case to set the output stream to the binary mode, which then avoids the end of line translation bug, we can avoid the corruption that I was seeing earlier. In theory, it should now load and run whatever it finds on the web camera. So let's give it a shot with a private binary. All right, I'm going to be using the webcam at the same time that I'm recording the screen and scanning a QR code. Let's see how that all works at once. It's a big QR code too, so. I'll know when I hear the telltale beep. There we go. Try it one more time, turn this way. There we go. A lot of moray pattern, at least when I'm looking at it, so I'm surprised it scanned, but it did. We'll see what we get. Sure enough, while I had to be careful to hold the QR code image quite flat and close to the camera, as soon as the camera resolved the image, it immediately extracted and executed the binary payload. That sort of begs the question of security. The big problem is I set things up to immediately execute whatever code it finds. That makes for a compelling demo, but in the real world, that'd be a huge security hole. Unless you're ready to start digitally signing the app somehow in the QR code, I think you need to treat this like the paper tape they used to use to bootstrap mainframes and minis. You'd only do it in a scenario where physical access implies security rights. Now, is there enough room left for anything useful? You bet. In some quick experimenting I just did before filming, I was able to get my binary down to 799 bytes, except it didn't run. I didn't have time to debug why yet, but if there's sufficient interest, let me know by leaving a comment with what you'd like me to do with that free 2K. I've got the skeleton of a Windows app, but should I flesh it out as a prime sieve or as a cool game? Maybe I could convince Oscar T. Gutierrez to partner with me and forgive me for mispronouncing his name and write a tiny game that runs under Windows. If someone knows him, give him a shout for me. Either way, let me know in the comments if there's sufficient interest to merit adding functionality and more features to the QR code app or if this should be a one and done. As you saw, I made two versions of the code, one with the binary directly in the QR code and one with it wrapped in UU encoding. Both worked, but of course the UU encoding requires one extra line in the shell script to decode the text version and convert it to binary. The reason for needing this wrapper is that ZBar Cam has a bug that corrupts the binary during extraction from the QR code if it's embedded directly. The binary QR codes themselves are correct and will work with the fixed ZBar Cam when you get it. I sort of take comfort in that extra UU encoding step myself, but it frustrated me that I needed to have it if I used the released version of ZBar Cam. But once version 23.92 is out, however, the issue should be moved as it should just work under Windows. And speaking of QR code apps and games, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Matt KC, from whom I learned of the ZBar Cam bug. He has a cool video of putting a tiny game inside a QR code, kind of like this. I wasn't aware of it until I went looking for solutions to the ZBar bug, and it's interesting to see the different approaches we actually take. For example, he used this C and some compression versus my assembly code and no compression. His games are not full Windows apps, but he has a really high quality and thoughtful implementation of Snake, that you might remember from the old uh, cell phones, that's small enough to fit within my QR code's remaining space. So maybe together we could make WinSnake for QR codes. We could start a whole new genre of demo gaming. So same deal. If you know him, reach out to find out if he's interested. And if not, check out his channel nonetheless. As for my own channel, if you haven't already, check out the episodes on retrocoding the Windows app as well as my episodes on software drag racing. Maybe start with the C vs C Sharp vs Python episode. And if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, it looks like about half my viewers are subscribed and about half aren't, so if the other half did, I'd have twice as many subscribers and we would be a big old party. And I like parties, so you know, sign up! In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.